Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to From Terras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Morneau. A new book shares personal essays viewing New Mexico through the eyes of Chicano and indigenous writers who share personal stories that may display unique identities but offer a shared love of their homeland of New Mexico. The book, Querencia, Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland, is out now and we're honored to be joined by the book's three editors. Please welcome Dr. Spencer Herrera, Assistant Professor in Spanish at NMSU, Dr. Vanessa Fonseca Chavez, Professor, Assistant Professor of English from Arizona State University, and Levi Romero, New Mexico's first Poet Laureate and Assistant Professor of Chicana and Chicano Studies at the University of New Mexico. I wanna thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, it is an honor to have you. Uh, this is a fascinating topic with so many voices sharing their personal stories on New Mexico, their homeland. I'd like to start with a basic question though about how this book was conceived. What were the inspirations? Uh, I would like to ask all of you that, please. One of you start. We had, you know, Levi and Vanessa and I've worked for many years together on different projects. And we have talked about New Mexico as a homeland and the beauty that the state has, but also uh, some of the complexities behind the state. And we looked at uh, places who might be interested in publishing an article or a dossier about it, and we didn't get the, the reception that we were hoping for. And so then we reached out to University of New Mexico Press, uh, particularly the editor of the Cadencia series, Dr. Enrique La Madrid, and they were excited about the topic. Um, and one of the things that we talked about was that there's been a lot of scholars who have written about Cadencia in the past, people that we highly respect. Um, and we wanted to bring in a younger generation of scholars, uh, you know, to reflect about New Mexico and to think about New Mexico um, in a new light. And so that's kind of, we started this dialogue between the three of us. And then we invited uh, a lot of scholars to join us, um, all different backgrounds, as you mentioned, uh, Chicano, Chicana, indigenous, Genisero, a lot of different voices to talk about a lot of different places in New Mexico and a lot of different experiences. Experiences. Uh, Vanessa, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, you were drawn to this project and um, you know, how the experience of, of your own background uh, played a role in you wanting to be a part of this? Absolutely. You know, I, Spencer was talking a little bit about these initial conversations that we were having in spaces like the Rocky Mountain Modern Language Association, the National Association for Chicano and Chicano Studies. So we were reaching out to all these individuals and really not getting, I think that we felt the sense that New Mexico wasn't being talked about in a way that we had hoped. And so we wanted to create a space to do that. But of course, having that conversation is particularly difficult. I think the three of us have very different ways of looking at Cadencia. And part of that is what is so exciting about the work that, that we have done is that, you know, I view it from the perspective of someone who is always searching for a cadencia from all these different spaces that I've lived in throughout New Mexico and then also outside of New Mexico. And so I really appreciated um, the author's perspectives in this collection because they all come from different places, like Spencer said, within New Mexico. But we look at cadencia in very different ways. And so you have that very sort of um, you know, Levi's cadencia is a cadencia that one might naturally go to in the scholarship, right? This is something that's been written about quite often. Yeah. But then as someone who is continually searching for cadencia, as, as in my case, um, it's quite different. And then you have Spencer, who is not from New Mexico, but is, you know, learning to appreciate what that means within a New Mexico context. Right. Levi, I, I want to ask you uh, about your background. Uh, and you shared it with us in this book about growing up in the village of Dixon, a community located between Española and Taos, and your feelings traveling back there. Uh, and it was almost like traveling back in time with what you shared with us about how the smells and the scenery and the memories that you shared in, 
in this book um, were really captured. I, I'd like to hear from you, uh, how do you feel that, you know, your contribution to this book, but also what do you hope this book can really give to people in New Mexico, particularly the next generation that Spencer mentioned? Yeah, um, in fact, that the house that I write about in the uh, introduction is the very house that I'm sitting in today. <laughs> so uh, it's it's my grandmother's house. Uh, I was raised here partly uh, with her in the summers. Uh, the house has gone through some pretty drastic uh, transformation since then. It didn't have uh, indoor plumbing or electricity or any of those modern amenities at that time. Um, but uh, it's still really a beautiful thing to be able to be where I grew up, the place that I consider my home. Um, and so not as Vanessa pointed out, not many people have that, um, that continuous um, connection to community, to family, to home, to place. Yeah. Um, but it connects, I think, to the indigenous model very well, which is a seven generations model. Uh, and it's a continuation of that. Uh, for me, and, and I think for, uh, for all the three of us, the most important thing about this book, um, one of them is that, uh, that it enables others to contemplate their own sense of cadencia, whatever that cadencia might be, and to get them to think about it and to explore what their cadencia is. Um, and if we can do that, then I think we've un accomplished our mission. It's not only just to present 18 different viewpoints on cadencia, by 18 different scholars, but to get countless of people out there now and the future to consider their own cadencia, because things are going to change in the future. And it's always important to know where it is that you come from, or at least be able to think about it. So I, I'd like to talk about that meaning, though, cadencia, um, what it means. A lot of folks may, may see it as the love for one's homeland. And I'd like to maybe hear from Spencer uh, on the meaning of it and how it plays a role in this book. It's a great question. And then also Vanessa alluded to it that I'm the only contributor slash editor who is not from New Mexico. And so, you know, it's an honor to be a part of the book, but it was also for me, a, you know, a big responsibility to think about Querencia because I, I'm from Houston, originally born and raised, so I'm Tejano. And many Tejanos, like myself and our families, we lost our land a long time ago. Um, you know, we lost it through the Texas Revolution. We lost land through the U.S.-Mexico War. And later we lost it through duplicitous legal acts or acts of violence perpetrated by groups like the Texas Rangers. And so we didn't grow up with land. Um, and I moved to New Mexico uh, when I was in my mid-20s. And as I tell people, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> um, I like that. So I moved here and I moved to Albuquerque. Uh, initially, I noticed there were a lot of, you know, Hispano people who still own land and retained water rights and indigenous communities that own land and that there were land grants and reservations, things that, you know, aren't very common in Texas at all. And it made me really reflect on this deep love of place and people. And so growing up, I remember as a, as a young adolescent, we were in Central Texas and we stopped at a beautiful scenic lookout and it was this gorgeous uh, landscape. And my grandmother had commented, you know, looking at the land, she said, eso era de nosotros, that used to be ours. And although I knew that land physically did not belong to us legally, right? I knew what she meant that generations before that that land had belonged to not Mexicano families, but also uh, Tejano families, of course, um, but just to, to the community, if you will. And so when I moved to New Mexico, I, I really developed a, a sense for that and um, a respect, but also an envy, if you will, right? Because although I have a deep love for, for where I'm from and the Tejano community, we didn't own land. So when I moved here, you know, there was a lot of learning and I'm still learning um, about New Mexico. And I think that's one of the things that we can learn is um, like Levi, you know, how he takes care of his land still. And, and that's mm -hmm. a continual process. It would be easy for him as a professor to just, you know, leave the land, let the land go. 
but once you let it go, then you also let a lot of, a lot of knowledge go. Yeah. And knowledge, that knowledge you just can't recuperate. Um, you can write about it, but it's one thing for it to be passed down generationally. And so, um, you know, I'm here as a learner. And once again, I, I'm, I'm humbled to be part of the book, but also it's a responsibility for me to write about that loss of land as an academic so that we, we learn our, our history and our past and hopefully don't repeat it. Yeah, I, Levi, you wrote about this, uh, your, the connection to the land and the people that work to preserve it and to help preserve it and fight for their rights, uh, for their land and their water rights, the history of that in your, in your community. You wrote about how there's, there's no um, murals or there's no uh, perhaps um, uh, monuments dedicated in New Mexico to that generation, to the generations of people who fought to dis sustain that and carry on the culture. Can you share with us just how important that is for people to understand in New Mexico? Well, I think it's something that uh, one of our uh, contributors, Moises Gonzalez, addressed in his essay, which was the idea of maintaining the cadencia. And his strong argument was that it's not, uh, it's not important enough to just claim your cadencia and to be in love with your cadencia, but that you have to maintain it, you have to contribute to its well-being. And I think that that is like primary in terms of like the cadencias that were that we inherited, that were handed down to us, the cadencias that we maintain for future generations. And uh, I think uh, also that like, you know, algún día when I do meet my antepasados, the first thing that they're gonna ask me is, ¿Cómo está mi cadencia? You know, in what condition did you leave it? And so I have a great responsibility to make sure that I leave it better than I found it, better than I inherited. And like Spencer points out, you know, it's not easy to do that when you work and you live outside of the village, but uh, we have to come back and we have to make sure that we continue to provide our own maintenance and continue on with the love of Cadencia. Now, Vanessa, uh, you mentioned about searching for your Cadencia, um, growing, being in New Mexico, uh, living here, but also being in other states. I, I know you are a professor at Arizona State right now, but you've also uh, been to Wyoming, uh, started your academic career there as a professor. Uh, so can you kind of share a little bit about that? And I believe you even uh, with Levi are leading a project that kind of describes that. Yeah, so I have moved about 35 times in my life wow. um, in and around until I was 25. It was in and around New Mexico uh, from a brief stint in Pinos Altos near Silver City to Grants to Blue Water to Pojoaque, back to Blue Water, back to Pojoaque, then to Albuquerque and in different places throughout Albuquerque. But so my family is from North northwestern New Mexico, so Grants, Gallup, Zuni area. And uh, one of the things that I always tell people is that my family is from a ghost town. And so it's a difficult thing to think about what your cadencia is when you can no longer even physically go back to that place, but nobody is there anymore. And so my grandmother is from the village of Atarque, which is near Fence Lake and Zuni Pueblo. Uh, the last residents to live in that area uh, was about in 1956. And so it's been a long time since people have been there. And of course, that history is entangled with, um, you know, Anglo settlement in the West um, and, you know, perceptions that white Anglo Texans brought to Northwestern New Mexico during that time period because of their experiences with Mexicanos in Texas and bringing sort of those same sentiments over to Northwestern New Mexico. And so I'm aware of all of that context. And um, when I first, uh, I did my PhD here at ASU as well. And so that was the first time that I left home. And I remember thinking I brought an air mattress to sleep on in my new apartment because in my mind it was temporary and I wasn't going to stay here. Um, I met someone whose cadencia is deeply planted here in Mesa, Arizona. And so for me, it's been really interesting to see what it looks like for someone from Arizona to have this really deep sense and love for place. And to also think about what does that mean being in partnership with someone who loves where they're from as much as you love where you're from and to be able to make those kind of negotiations. And so we both collectively decided to go to Wyoming and it was a great experience because there were a lot of Hispanic New Mexican families in Wyoming. Um, and this is a project that Levi and I are working on the following the Manito Trail project 
that had this love for New Mexico and they travel along I-25 through Colorado back into New Mexico to sort of regenerate their querencia from time to time. And that includes going back to New Mexico for fiestas, that includes sending a representative to go get some green chili and bring it back for all the families. And Levi, uh, Levi's wife's family is from Riverton, Wyoming, and he writes about it in his chapter in the Cadencia volume. And so I think about not only how we grew up with a deep sense of Cadencia, but also how we travel with that deep sense of, of love, of place everywhere we go, and the various ways that we try to reconnect with our home while we're away from it. Now, one thing in the book that covers uh, a tradition, a history, in New Mexico is the discussion, and I guess it's it's sort of a, it's almost like a research paper uh, looking at the Las Vegas fiesta uh, that are there. Um, and the book talks about uh, the history of the fiestas and how it serves as a reunion point for so many people in that community that grew up there and left the community and they look forward to returning it's really heartwarming when you start reading that chapter and uh, learn about that history. But then after you hear from people, they, they have mixed emotions about what the fiestas have turned into now where they kind of share like they don't remember it being that way. It's not how they remembered it. They see traditions changing. Can, can you talk about that a little bit and, and let us know kind of exactly what's happening? Because this is something that we may be seeing across the entire state of New Mexico. Uh, we hang on to so many traditions and events, but over time they change and people leave and generations uh, are, are coming up. And if they're not getting that um, knowledge and history of their own culture, I mean, how does that really change New Mexico in a way that we're living today? Can you share some of that? Absolutely, you know, I don't think, I think that that first we have to recognize that traditions will change over time and that Lillian Gorman in her chapter about uh, the patriotic process of the fiestas in Las Vegas really talks about this idea of the myth of return, right? So when people come back to Las Vegas, they expect a particular type of fiesta to be taking place and it's not what they remember and that's okay. I think that what we have to remember is that there's a spirit of it that continues on and that we need to remember that that spirit is just as important as an ex an acceptance of the ways that things will change over time. Of course, we're always grateful to, to our ancestors and our former generations who remember the way that things used to be. And we have a lot of knowledge that we can pick up from that. We have a lot that we can learn from that. But of course we have to, as we did with this collection, think about how new generations are approaching those same sort of traditional ideas, but with different perspectives. What I thought was very interesting about Lillian's chapter is that, um, you know, from from the Manito Trail perspective with Levi and I, we're hearing folks like Connie Coca, who's from Watrous, New Mexico, talking about, you know, we have our family vacation planned every year to coincide with the Las Vegas fiestas. And they really look at it not as, you know, while how things have changed, but really more about how to regenerate their cadencia and reconnect with their homeland before they go back to Wyoming. And so it's interesting that, you know, we can read that chapter and we can even look at that chapter in lots of different ways. Um, my aunt uh, lives in Las Vegas and she's lived there for a long time. She teaches French in Las Vegas. So I'm always curious to see, you know, what does it look like for someone who is Hispano, but who teaches not Spanish, you know, in the school system? How does that identity get uh, mixed into, you know, Las Vegas culture and community? Spencer, you mentioned in the book that New Mexico is a sort of triptych. Um, you know, it's kind of like, like we see maybe on Instagram today with three pictures of something forming one giant photo, I think we see that a lot. Or, uh, but you mentioned that in, in the book. Can you kind of describe how we see that in New Mexico, in media and in the land? Well, I start off with uh, basically reviewing, analyzing this, this film that was, that's kind of old. It's called Enam Miguel. It was produced by the U.S. government. You can find it on YouTube and now Miguel, the original documentary. And it's a beautiful documentary in many ways. What I find fascinating about it is that um, the producers were looking for an American family, someone who exuded American values. And they started in Oklahoma and they just kept driving west until they got to the town of Cordoba 
uh, New Mexico, which is near Taos. So to find this American family, they wind up uh, working with an Espano family whose first language is Spanish and they're sheep herders. And so I just find that fascinating. It's a beautiful film and it has to do with the Cold War and basically protecting American values from this sort of fear of the other. And then I look at, uh, I kind of compare that to a current uh, you know, marketing strategy, which is the New Mexico True brand, which you know has a lot of great uh, imagery, you know, uh, beautiful pictures, and you know, basically uh, lauding the beauty, the landscape of New Mexico. But one of the troubles I have with that um, marketing strategy is that although we do want to bring tourists to the state, most of the tourists. Uh, come from in the state and they just travel around the state. But, you know, we don't look at the complexities behind, um, you know, New Mexico. And so, yes, we have a beautiful state and White Sands has really white sand and uh, Wheeler's Peak is really high and those things are great. But we also have a lot of poverty here. Uh, we have a struggling uh, educational system. And so, you know, I compare that to a different program uh, called New Mexico Truth, which highlights some of these challenges that we have. And, uh, but then I end with Levi's poem, Molino Abandonado. And so although we talk about the beauty of New Mexico and this deep love of place, we have to remember it's also a deep love of people. And so uh, Levi, uh, in this poem from his book, uh, A Poetry of Remembrance, goes back to a town uh, and he has a class right about objects that are in that town and he writes a poem about this abandoned uh, grist mill and one of the lines talks about you know Evelino Abandonado and I call and I, and I play with that language a little bit that Levi uses it's a beautiful poem and Levi is, is a wonderful poet and I said well maybe it's not Evelino Abandonado maybe it's El Pueblo Abandonado maybe the town has been abandoned and not that people have abandoned the town but the it's vice versa right um, that the town has been abandoned by the people. Um, and so we need to look at that and think about how we can improve our state, not just recognize its beauty, which is, of course, it is beautiful, but also think about how we can improve it so that the people that live in this state can also have you know, good lives. So how can the power of storytelling help that, Spencer? a great question. Uh, Kelly uh, Medina Lopez has a great article in the book talking about Southern New Mexico. And, you know, she talks about that her cadency is different because she grew up in a different generation. She didn't grow up farming. She didn't grow up in an, an adobe home. Um, so she thought about that and she realized that her cadencia is based on storytelling, right? Storytelling is how we remember, you know, um, how our parents or grandparents fell in love, how they moved to a certain town. Um, we were blessed to have Rodolfo Anaya um, write the forward to this book. And he talks about that in his book, how they, you know, they bought a solar in Eastern New Mexico and brick by brick that they, that they built that, that adobe house, right? And those stories are important because it, it basically it entrenches you into the land you create roots in the community and you realize where you're from and i think that that storytelling it you know it, t it teaches us lessons but it also connects to generations right um, a lot of us when we go you know if we're lucky enough to have grandparents or great grandparents that's how we learn who we are through the storytelling they're our first teachers our parents are our first teachers our grandparents are our first teachers and it connects us to who we are. It gives us a sense of place and also a sense of being and that we're not recent immigrants into this country, that we've been here for generations and generations. And this, this land is, is, is as ours as much as anyone else's. And so it brought into a story, not just about New Mexico, but about this country, right? When we learn yeah. about rock, we should also be learning about Acoma and how long those communities have been here. Um, and so it really broadens the idea of what it means to be American, not just New Mexican, but also what it means to be American and a resident and a citizen of this country. 
Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I, I want to ask you all about something that I think is, is really important, and, and that is uh, the things you talked about, Spencer, are becoming more common in our national dialogue due to events we've seen uh, and more people becoming aware of systematic uh, discrimination, racism, oppression that have existed in our history. And I'd like to hear from you, Levi, how do you feel that a book like this and the story shared in it can really help uh, address that dialogue and contribute to that dialogue that we're having as a country? Well, I think uh, what the book does, uh, again, it's an invitation for people to contribute their own histories and their own stories. And that was one of the things that really appealed to me most about the cover of the book uh, with the missing historical piece there on the historical marker yeah. is that that left it open, left the space there for other people to bring in their history, to bring in their stories. And I think that if we create, uh, you know, um, a table in which all of us can gather around that table and the stories are the food, they are what nurtures us, they are what feeds us, they are what sustains us, but we have to make room at that table for everybody to sit down and partake. Um, like the, the verso in, in the Molino Abandonado poem, um, you know, el banquete está abierto pa el que venga, and the banquet is open to all who want to come in and join. And it's the banquet of histories, of stories, of being welcomed, of feeling like you belong. Doesn't matter where you're from. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I, I want to thank you all for, for joining us. I hope to carry on this dialogue in the future with all of you because it's such a fascinating topic that I think is really captivating our country right now. And I want to thank you for sharing your work with us on the program. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. And we want to thank you for joining us for From Terras to Changing America. I'm Anthony Morneau. We'll see you next time.